Hi, my name is Justin. This is an exam three review for Bio 182. We're going to try to keep the lecture short this time and focus mainly on the practice problems. Starting off with interspecies interactions. Inter meaning between different species. And the scope of each one of these interactions, we want to more think about it, about it on the individual level, where one individual of a species will interact with one individual of a different species. So we're going to start with predation. This is where one species eats another one. This is a plus minus interaction meaning one entity is winning or gaining something, and the other one is losing or uh, being costed. So um, the, the, the one winning here would be the predator, it gets something to eat, and the one losing would be the prey, it loses its life. For herbivory, it's where one species eats another that's a plant. So this can get more complicated when you think about like plants wanting their seeds to get spread around, but for the purposes of this exam, the one winning would be the one, the herbivore eating the plant, and the one losing would be the plant. Next is competition. This is where two species use the same limited resource, and because one species is present, it limits the amount of that resource for the other one. So it's not as direct as the interactions that we talked about before, but think about it this way. You have two species of snake, and they both eat the same mouse. Because one, spe because one species is present, either one, and it eats mice, that means that there's less mice available for the other one. And if you just got rid of one species entirely, it would allow the other species a benefit. It would have a lot more mice available to it. So because of that, their presence negatively impacts each other. So it's a minus minus interaction. So we talked about food. An example of space could maybe be a spe two species of bird and they don't make their own nests. They instead find woodpecker nests that are already built into a tree and they use those. But because both of the species are competing with one another, they have less available or potential uh, spots to make a nest. Mutualism. This is where both species interact and get something good out of their, their interaction. So it could be something like uh, the bacteria that you have within your stomach. They, a lot of them help you digest food. So that is a plus for you and it's a plus for them because it gives them a warm and suitable environment for them to reproduce. So that is a plus plus interaction. Both entities are gaining because of their interaction. And then we have parasitism, a plus minus interaction. So that's where one species benefits at the cost of the other one. Uh, we think about a, the most common example would be thinking about a parasite that would enter you like a tapeworm and then it would eat your nutrients so it gains and then you just lose energy and become thinner, so you are losing, but it doesn't have to be like that. It can be more of an external thing. So next we have commensalism. This is where one species benefit, but the other is not affected. So uh, yeah, so one of them is getting, because one species, because of its interaction with the other one, is getting something good out of it, but the other one is just neutral. An example of this would be, I know a lot of large, some larger fish, they have smaller fish that follow it, and uh, when the larger fish, uh, like, um, after it eats something, the little fish get the remains that the larger fish wasn't going to eat anyways. But, uh, so the benefit here for the smaller fish is that they get more food, but the larger fish wasn't going to really eat them anyways, so it's not really affected. So that would be commensalism. So we're going to talk about coevolution now, which is would be linked evolution between uh, two species or multiple species. So species can influence each other's evolution if they have close interactions with one another, like all those on the previous page. So the species must actually interact with each other and change the selective pressures of each other. Just because you have species living in a in the same environment, that doesn't mean that they're actually impacting one another. So let's talk about some examples of how this might happen. So the first one that I put would be competition. There are two species of birds that compete for one kind of seed. They continually have to compete with each other. So the, the this strengthens the selective pressures. It, the reason why is because there is less seeds available, which means that uh, there was less, you know, so there's less food available for the birds, and uh, that means that alleles that favor the procurement of this food would be selected for. So both of these species would continually um, evolve traits that allow them the, the food because of the other one reducing the amount of food available. So um, this was coevolution because if you just removed one species of bird, you would reduce that selective pressure and they likely would have had different evolutionary paths. But because they're both present, they influence each other. And next we have predation. 
So the, sp the prey species will evolve traits to escape the predator. And in the predator, now that its prey is harder to catch, alleles that help it uh, become more efficient at chasing prey species and getting the food will become more popular. So it evolved that way. And then they both kind of uh, chase each other. And mutualism would be, um, let's say that two species start to interact and that it benefits them initially. That means that alleles that favor this relationship or help facilitate it would become more popular and then they would both evolve together. They would evolve around this mutualistic relationship. And next we have convergent evolution. Convergent evolution is completely different from coevolution. You'll probably get a question on the exam trying to trick you. They're different. So convergent evolution is where different species without that common ancestor independently evolve similar traits that help with their similar environments. So uh, uh, let me explain that a little bit more. So they live in similar environments, which means that there are similar selective pressures. And that means that there are similar alleles that are favored. And that results in the, those similar like traits that you see between them. So uh, let's say birds and bees. So they don't have a common ancestor that had wings, but they both evolved similar structures. And yeah, and these similar structures are called analogous structures. And it's very important to know that they were not the result of a common ancestor. So we're going to talk about uh, what that means more right now. So a shared ancestry and homologous structure. So a shared ancestor is just like an, um, if you think about speciation, you have one species and then uh, different species will speciate off of it as more differences are built up. But um, that common ancestor has some traits in a species that split off of it, retain those traits. Because they retain those traits, they're also similar to one another. That's what we're talking about here. Homologous traits are similar or even same structures between two species that are the result of having a shared ancestor with the same or similar structure. So what happened was that that shared ancestor evolved the trait. And then the subsequent species that, speciation, that speciated off retained that trait. And because they retained that trait and they came the same common ancestor, they are similar in that regard. So compared to what we talked about before, those uh, th the, the similar traits between them were evolved independently. But over here, it was evolved one time and then it was retained. So an example would be arm structure among ca humans, cats, whales, and bats. While they look different, they have the same general structure, which, is, which would be four parts. You have your uh, blue ones, your green ones, and then your yellow ones, and your orange ones, and your, your lilac ones. But that, these are the result of not being evolved independently four times, but having a common ancestor that had a similar bone structure in the arm, and then they retain them. So these are homologous structures, this arm structure. Next, we're going to talk about ecosystems. So an organism is an individual living thing, individual. A population are multiple same species organisms living and interacting in the same area. A community are populations that live and interact in the same area. So uh, based on uh, the definition over here, these would be different species. So an organism might be uh, a beetle, a type, a, 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 um, a type of beetle called um, fan beetle. So fan beetle. And then a population could be uh, a group of fan beetles living in the same area. And then a community could be fan beetles and wall beetles living in the same area. Now the ecosystem is the most inclusive aspect of it and it includes abiotic factors. So it includes the biotic factors which would be the organisms, the community, so the different populations that make up community, and their physical environment which would be abiotic factors. That could be like precipitation, O2 levels, um, salt levels, whatnot. So inclusion from high to low, ecosystem encompasses all of these. But in a community is larger than a population because it includes multiple populations. A population is a population of one kind of species, and an organism is what makes up the population and is the smallest unit possible for a, from a biological standpoint. So let's talk about energy exchange and tropic levels. So a tropic level, it, we, we kind of um, identify them, and they're not always this simple, but as what eats what. So in this, this is the, uh, yeah. So living things contain some amount of energy. But the energy of a living thing is not transferred 100% to the living that eats it, only about 10%. Thus, for each link, 
90% of the energy present in the prior link was lost. Each higher trophic level has only 10% of the energy of the prior trophic level. So let's look at the, the, the producers over here, the plants. They have 10,000 kilocalories worth of energy. But after they're eaten by the primary consumers, they only have 1,000 kilocalories. So they lost 9,000, that's a 9% 9 loss, that's a 90% loss, and it's only 10% of what was there originally. And then as we go up, it's 10% each time. Or the, the new tropic level only has 10% energy, 90% is loss. So 10,000 to 1,000 to 100 to 10. So why is it not 1 to 1? Why doesn't it go from 10,000 to 10,000 to 10,000? So there are a couple of different reasons. By the second law of thermodynamics, some energy is lost through heat. Some energy is used by the organism to incorporate the energy. So when the snake eats the rabbit, it can't just absorb the energy passively. It has to do a bunch of different digestive processes. It has to do all of that. And that, that in itself takes energy. So not all the energy from the rabbit is able to be used. Oh, wait, that's not really relevant. Uh, but so yeah, it's relevant here. Not all the energy is able to be harvested. So not everything within this rabbit that has energy is able to be harvested. There could be something like cellulose, which snakes don't have the digestive enzymes to break down. And oftentimes, an organism just doesn't eat the entirety of its food's body. So like they don't, maybe maybe they kind of rip it apart and they eat the flesh, but they don't eat the bones, that kind of thing. So those bones have energy, but they're not eaten. So higher tropic levels tend to have much smaller populations than lower tropic levels as a result of their higher energy demands and that inefficient energy exchange. So in a given population, you might have like a ton of biomass of leaves and stuff or plants, but you might only have like eight eagles. So matter exchange tropic levels, matter and energy cannot be destroyed, just changed. An important note is that matter does not turn into energy, and energy does not turn into matter. So, for tropic le uh, levels, matter is not obtained one to one. The biomass at one tropic level is not equivalent to the biomass at the other one. So, consumers don't utilize all of the matter they eat. You know, like uh, they, they eat it and then they pass a lot of it through, like defecation, which makes sense. So, higher tropic levels have less biomass across all its organisms compared to lower tropic levels. Now, I'm going to talk about the carbon cycle. So carbon as matter cannot be destroyed, it can just be moved around in different forms. So carbon dioxide, CO2, it, it, that's, that's where carbon is present in a gaseous form in the atmosphere. So CO2 increases by cellular respiration. Uh, all organisms undergo cellular respiration, and a byproduct of that is CO2. So an example of that would be decomposers like mushrooms, like fungi and uh, bacteria, which break down dead organisms. And, and as they do that, they undergo, they respire cellular respiration, and that releases CO2, so carbon from the dead into the atmosphere. CO2, atmosphere CO2 can be reduced by photosynthesis. So plants can take an atmosphere CO2 and then fixate them into, uh, fixate the carbon as part of their structure into like sugars and stuff. And CO2 could be created and like a lot. Like CO2 outputs have increased drastically in the past like 200 years and that's because of fossil fuel burning, different gases are burned and that gives off CO2. And that's everything. So now we're going to talk about the practice problems. I think they're a lot more important. We're going to be going over practice problems for exam 3. I made them after looking at the exam. I recommend taking a look at them yourself. But let's get into it. Question 1. See food chain in figure 1. Before being eaten, plant had managed to use the sunlight it has been exposed to over its lifetime to create 50 energy units of chemical energy. Assuming normal ecosystem dynamics, how much chemical energy from the plant is now present in the pill bill? So we have 50 energy units and that's currently in the plant. But the plant is eaten by Bibbly Dibbly. But we know from um, our general knowledge of uh, food chains, that when something is eaten, it is only able to take in about 10% of the energy that was within that. And that applies to tropic levels as well, where going from one tropic level to a higher tropic level, that higher tropic level has only 10% of the energy compared to the lower tropic level. But anyways, so we have 50 energy units, but when we go to that Bibbly Dibbly and it ate it, it can only incorporate 10% of that. So that's 50 energy units. And then the Bibbly Dibbly is eaten by the horror of the fourth degree, 
and that um, can only incorporate 10% of that. 10% of 5 is 0 0.5, so that would be horror of the 4th degree. Now the horror of the 4th degree is even but a walking pain. And the walking pain is only able to incorporate 10% of 0 0.5 energy units. Oopsie. So that would be 0 0.05 energy units. And finally, the walking pain is eaten by Pilbo. And his only Pilbo is only able to incorporate 10% of that, which would be 0 0.005 energy units. So Pilbo has 0 0.005 energy units. That came from plant. Oops, I don't want to do that. See figure one. True or false? In a given ecosystem, walking pains are more common in horrors of the fourth degree. Well, we know that as you go up tropic levels, so you go up the food chain, things get less efficient, and things on the on the higher end of the food chain need more energy. And that means that generally, for things at a higher tropic level, there are much less of them compared to lower tropic levels. So there would be a lot of plants, and there would be less bibbly dibblies, even less horrors of the fourth degree less walking pains, and the smallest amount of pilbos. So walking pains would be less common than horrors of the fourth degree because they're up the food chain. So that would be false. See figure one, which thing is most common, which is most rare, rarest? So we kind of already talked about that, but most common would be plant. It's the lowest on the tropic level. And then the rarest would be pilbos. They're the highest up. So, question three. It introduces some wacky characters in figure two. There's a waggle, dog, oh, oops, I forgot about eyes. And who could forget skateboard? I didn't. I, but anyways, anyways, these wacky characters are actually part of the same ecosystem as those in figure one. Dogs eat plants. Skateboards burrow themselves deep into walking panes and use some resources but drastically increase the strength and survivability of the walking pains they reside in. Waggles enter Bibbly Dibblies and lay a single egg. The egg secretes hormones, which induce the Bibbly Dibblies to undergo to undergo angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels, to directly provide itself with the Bibbly Dibblies oxygen and nutrients. Once a sufficient size, the egg hatches, and the waggle wiggles around in the body for fun, touching all the nerves it can, and finally, it exits through the mouth. If, and only if, the Bibbly Dibbly is still alive, the waggle will flay the Bibbly Dibbly and then throw the skin away. Eyes follow pilbos for protection, but pilbos don't need them. They more so don't mind them being around. Given these possible interactions, commensalism, paratism, Predation, competition, mutualism, and herbivory complete the table below. So here's uh, our organism pairs are given over here, and we're asked to see if there's an interaction between them. So plants and bibbly dibbly. Bibbly dibblies eat plants. That this is herbivory. Skateboard and walking pain. So the skateboard will enter the walking pain and they get something out of it. But the walking pains are also they also get something out of it, and they're, they are able to survive longer because of the skateboards. So this would be a mutualistic interaction. The dog and the bibbly dibbly. So the dog, if you recall, will eat plants as well. So while the bibbly dibblies and the dogs might not interact directly, because they eat the same thing, there's competition happening between them. They use up each other's resources. So this would be a competition compet. This would be competition, that interaction. Pilbo and eyes. So the eyes will follow the pilbos around, and the pilbos, uh, the things are scared of them, so the eyes have less predators around it that are willing to eat it. But the pilbo doesn't get anything beneficial out of the eyes being around, but it's also not being hurt. So this would be commensalism, where something gains because of the other thing, but, but not at the cost. The waggle and the bibbly dibbly. So the waggle is very parasitic. It will enter the bibbly dibbly. It'll use its resources, 
it'll screw up the Bibbly Dibbly, and the Bibbly Dibbly will die. So that is a parasitic relationship. Something is benefiting, and the other thing at the cost of the, the host. So which wins, if any? So in this case, it'd be the Bibbly Dibbly. It gets food, which loses. That would be the plant. Gets eaten. Not relevant. Skateboard and walking pain. That's a mutualistic relationship. Skateboard, walking pain. Not applicable. Not applicable. The dog and the bibbly dibbly. Uh, neither of them wins by this particular interaction. None, which loses. That would be the dog. That would be the bibbly dibbly. For the pillbow and the eyes. The pilbo is getting, I'm oh, sorry, the, the eyes are getting protection. The pilbo isn't losing anything. So that would be not applicable. So it, it's just, it's just fine with it. It doesn't really matter. Which wins very clearly the waggle. It gets a lot of resources, which loses. Fibbly dibbly, it dies. And that's not applicable. They're both perfected in some way. Looking at the organism pairs in question three, which are likely to co-evolve one another. So I think that would be all of them, except for the commensalism relationship. Everything but the pilbo and eyes interaction. Now over here, the the pil the eyes might have a big benefit from following the pilbo around. So it might um, alleles that that help it facilitate this interaction might be favored and it might evolve because of the pilbo, but the pilbo will not be evolving because of the eyes. When we think about co-evolution, we think about a reciprocal thing. They both impact the evolutionary pathway of each other. The eyes are not affecting the pilbo. But everything else is one is two-way. Which model in figure three is correct? Okay, so we're looking at organisms, populations, and communities and ecosystems. So an organism is part of an ecosystem, a community, and a population. Most immediately, it would be a part of the population. So let's see if there's one okay, over here. And a population is a, is only one, one species of organisms. So is an, yeah. And in a community are multiple populations. So um, a population would be part of a community. So that would be this one. And then a community would be part of the ecosystem. So that would be C. Order, looking at figure three, order the shapes by most restricted to least restricted. So, um, what I meant by that is, um, so when you look at a, at a population, you're only looking at one species of organisms. But when you're looking at a community, you're looking at multiple populations, which means that you're looking at multiple species. So the community would be less restricted than the population, and the population would be more restrictive in its definition. That was, that's kind of like what I was trying to ask in this question. I don't think I did the greatest. But the most uh, stringent, restricted definition would be the organism. And then there would be population. And then community, and then ecosystem. So the eco ecosystem encompasses everything, including the abiotic factors, community, uh, accounts for all the biotic factors. The population only accounts for a subset of those biological factors, just of one species. And an organism is just a single biological factor. Question seven: True or false? Convergent evolution is the same as uh, convergent evolution is the same as coevolution. That would be false. They are different. So, um, convergent evolution is where two species evolve a similar trait or a similar structure because of their similar environments but independently of one another they did not impact each other and co-evolution is where they were impacting each other they lived in the same area and we were able to notice that because directly because of the presence of one there was a reciprocal exchange or interaction such that they influenced each other's evolution Horrors of the second degree once had the ability to fly. Once they evolved the trait to swim and consume fish or something, they slowly, over the course of 200,000 years, lost the body composition to fly. How might this be explained? Multiple answers might be correct. 
A. Because they didn't use them for flying, their wing muscles gradually got less suited for flying. They spread this onto their offspring, who continued to lose more flying ability throughout their lifetimes, and etc. So, that was a very common misconception before natural selection by evolution was popularized. Um, and that does not hold up. You know, like, if you cut off your finger and you have a kid, that kid will likely have all their fingers as well. So, somatic changes over one's lifetime, like this one, does not really impact the genetics of the offspring. Evolution by natural selection. Costs of being able to fly were greater than the benefits of being able to fly. Now this makes sense. So traits or just things in general about your body, they take energy to produce, they take energy to have available to them. And because in this environment, they were swimming predominantly to get their food, well, uh, they didn't really have a need to fly anymore. So over time, alleles that where they were not able to fly were favored because they devoted less energy to that when they didn't really need to be able to fly. So I think that this would be true. Now the evolution by natural selection and cost of being able to fly were less benefits. There were less benefits than of being able. Oof. Okay, of being able to fly. Okay, wait, cost of the, oh yeah, yeah. So that would be incorrect. So this doesn't make any sense. Like, um, if the costs of being able to fly were lesser than the benefits, that means that the benefits are greater. So if we're talking about natural selection, uh, where it favors beneficial alleles, that would not, that would not be relevant. So random chance, this is correct. So we think about evolution oftentimes in terms of natural selection where there is a kind of a reason for things to happen, but a lot of times things just kind of happen. So for whatever reason, like let's say that um, there were, like it got popularized that they were not able to fly. And then what happened was a population bottleneck where by chance, a bunch of the horrors of the second degrees just died and those happened to be able to fly. And the ones that were left over couldn't fly. That would just be a random chance. There wasn't any rhyme or reason to it. Question 9. Bats and birds share a common ancestor. Their wings in the context of each other are likely... So, homologous structures, um, I think that would be correct. Because those are traits that are similar to one another, but they weren't evolved independently. They're because they were present on a common ancestor. So the wings, both bats and birds have wings, and those are similar structures, but they also share that common ancestor. So because of that, we call them homologous structures. These, these structures are because of that ancestor having it, and then they inherited it. Analogous structures are the, for, are the result of convergent evolution, where uh, convergent evolution is basically the opposite of um, shared ancestry, which would be independent evolution of similar traits. And convergent structures, I don't think that's a thing. Profusive structures, not a thing either. Okay, question 10. Species A and B live on separate islands with no overlap. Both islands are oxygen poor and both end up evolving noses, which help take in more oxygen. These structures would be called, so we know, we know it's not homologous traits uh, because they, they, uh, they didn't have a common ancestor that had those noses before. If they did, they would have already had noses and they would have not evolved a nose, you know. So they're not homologous structures. We already said that these two weren't real, so we know it's analogous structures, but why? So what happened over here is that species A and B, they are independent of one another, but they lived in similar environments. Uh, poor oxygen, and then they ended up evolving similar traits. So these similar traits are analogous structures, but they were evolved independently of one another. Take a virus that only accepts or only affects the species of crabs. The trend goes as virus kills off most of crabs, except ones that have the alleles to be resistant to the virus. Eventually, virus has gained alleles through mutation that allow them to wreak havoc again, and this repeats the cycle. This is an example of, so it's not predate, predation. If anything, it would just be uh, parasitism. It's not artificial selection. That's where humans will select traits that they like and they find valuable. It's not really convergent evolution because they don't really share the same environment, but it would be co-evolution. 
because both of their evolutionary pathways are linked to one another and it is reciprocal. So the 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 virus relies on reproduction on um, on the host on the uh, uh, using the crab to reproduce. So when the crab the crab does not like this and it is not beneficial. So that means that alleles that work to counter this are beneficial and they're accumulated. But what's going to happen is that they, they become more resistant and then the virus that's a, that's a selective pressure. In order to survive, um, alleles that favor its ability to infect the host crab are favored and then so the virus gets better at infecting. And because of that, they just keep on like trying to one-up each other. So coagulation, they're evolving and they're related to one another. Okay, which processes or process increases carbon in the form of CO2? Decomposers undergoing photosynthesis. Well, photosynthesis, the byproducts that would be O2. So they're not releasing CO2. In fact, they're taking in CO2. So they would be reducing the CO2. And also, decomposers don't undergo photosynthesis. They're, uh, they just do cellular respiration. That is false. Decomposers uh, undergoing cellular respiration. That would be true. So bacteria, fungi, you die, they break you down. And as they break you down, they undergo cellular respiration. And uh, that increases uh, atmospheric CO2. So as like, they ate you, or they take they took in carbon from you, uh, like sugars and whatnot, they broke those down, and those were released and CO2 into the environment. Plants undergoing photosynthesis. So plants do do photosynthesis. But photosynthesis, the byproduct, the main one, is O2, not CO2. Plants undergoing photocellular respiration. They do undergo cellular respiration as well, and they do release CO2, especially at night, even though they do take it in. So that would be correct. Burning of fossil fuels, so that's true. So burning of gases, factory things, they uh, when they use up those fuels, they uh, oops, when they use up those fuels, they uh, release a lot of CO two into the environment. Question thirteen: Which processes decrease carbon in the form of CO two? So basically, CO two is an atmospheric gas. So it's asking which processes can remove the CO, atmospheric CO2 and put them into other forms. So decomposers undergoing photosynthesis. Well, I mean, photosynthesis does take an atmospheric CO2 and it produces O2 as a byproduct, but those uh, carbons within the CO2 uh, are incorporated into the organism that is undergoing photosynthesis, but decomposers don't undergo photosynthesis. Decomposers are undergoing cellular respiration, that would increase CO2, not uh, decrease it. Plants are undergoing photosynthesis, that's true. So photosynthesis would increase, um, would decrease the amount of CO2 as a plant will take in uh, atmospheric CO2 to build sugars and whatnot. True or false? Energy and matter transfer from tropic levels is one, not 100% efficient because matter is converted into energy for organisms to live. So one part of that is true. It is not 100% efficient. It's more like 10% efficient. But matter is never destroyed, just converted into different forms of matter, but not energy. So kind of, I guess it, it might make sense, you know, like you eat food and then you burn that to like make energy, but that's not what's happening. You know, like um, everything is being accounted for. The reason why it's not 100% efficient could be uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, heat is lost as a... Uh, sorry, uh, energy is lost in the form of heat, or uh, energy is taken in order to produce energy. So yeah, there's a cost in order to gain. But yeah, that would be false. And I know I'm not doing a very great job with this. I am very tired, but please email me if it is confusing and I would like to help you. Question 15. How would carbon atoms inside of you be released? There are multiple correct answers possible. So cellular respiration, yeah. Cellular respiration for anything will release CO2 to the environment. Oops. Decomposers, that would be true. Like when you when you die, they'll eat you and then they will release CO2 into the environment. Like they'll undergo cellular respiration after they eat you. Or I keep on doing that. 
defecating. Yeah, that's true. I mean, like, there's carbon within your feces. Yeah. Photosynthesis. We don't do photosynthesis. And even if we did, that would not release carbon. That would take in carbon. Well, thank you, and good luck on your exam. Please email me any questions. Okay, okay, oh, oh my god, oh, stop, 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 is a Dairy Queen booth. Mm -hmm. All right, screw it. Oh, no, no. You're gonna get on that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, ouch. Uh, you know, Joseph, I, I, I tried to get out a couple times, but I'm just not sure. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> 